diverged in a yellow wood and sorry i could not travel both and be one travel so thought the little tear drop as it stood at the junction of the path it was meant to take and a new untouched fistula tract the nasolacrimal passage develops from the ectoderm in the nasooptic fissure from the 32nd day and canalization begins in the 60 day old embryo there are several hypotheses about the development of lacrimal fistula overgrowth of outer wall of nasolacrimal duct amniotic bands and inflammation from dacryocystitis cord of cells extending inwards as lacrimal and large failure of its involution and subsequent canalization dysfunctional fusion of surface ectoderm after invagination the most accepted theory however is that the fistula is an accessory canaliculus this is based on histopathological studies done by welham and bergen the origin of the congenital lacrimal fistula can be traced to either one of the canaliculi the common canaliculus lacrimal sac or the nasolacrimal duct congenital lacrimal fistula is estimated to occur in one of 2000 live births the incidence may actually be higher since many of the cases are asymptomatic or resolve with spontaneous occlusion of their tract they can present immediately after birth or later in life and affect both genders with equal frequency congenital lacrimal fistula is an ill understood and often troublesome entity in contrast to the more commonly encountered acquired lacrimal fistula the congenital one has a smooth appearance with only clear fluid exuding from it most cases are unilateral and situated in feronasal to the medial canthus a fine probe runs up the tract backwards and medially but follows a slight curve posteriorly the length of the tract invariably measures out to be around 4 to 6 mm congenital lacrimal fistulae are frequently asymptomatic when the tear however does choose this path children present with epiphora from the fistula either spontaneously or on manipulating the area around fluorescein dye can be used to identify the skin opening in children it was earlier thought that the congenital lacrimal fistulae are an isolated entity but several reports have shown their association with ocular and systemic conditions such cases are frequently bilateral there are anatomical abnormalities of the lacrimal apparatus or certain systemic conditions diagnosis is based on clinical examination probing and irrigation the site of communication can be identified by determining where a lacrimal probe placed through fistula makes contact with probes introduced through the upper and lower canaliculi dacryocystography and nuclear scintigraphy may be required to visualize the anatomy when abnormality in the other nasolacrimal structures is suspected and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black oh i kept the first for another day yet knowing how way leads on to way i doubted if i should ever come back now once the patient is symptomatic or has an associated nasolacrimal duct obstruction there is no turning back and it requires treatment various management modalities have been advocated including cauterization but this can cause damage to the nasolacrimal duct with secondary epiphora simple excision of the cutaneous opening is of short term benefit because the fistula invariably recurs most cases can be treated successfully with simple excision of the whole of the fistula tract adjunctive dacryocystorhinostomy and lacrimal intubation can be reserved for patients with associated abnormalities of lacrimal outflow tract as described 
Thus, pre-operative evaluation of the lacrimal drainage system is very important. Here we describe a simple closed excision of an uncomplicated congenital lacrimal fistula in a 3-year-old girl. A thin probe is guided through the fistula to trace its path. A crescentic incision is marked. A Bart Parker blade is used for cutting, making a controlled curvilinear incision. The probe is a great help during superficial and deeper dissection. Spreading rather than cutting movements of a spring scissor around the delicate fistulous tract avoids unnecessary bleeding. Dissection is continued till anterior wall of sac covered by orbicularis is reached. This appears as a widened out flask shaped area. Once the fistulous tract is seen to reach this and vanish underneath it, we feel there is no need to dissect further and possibly jeopardize the vital structures like the canaliculus or the lacrimal sac. The fistulous tract is cut after removing the probe to reveal a hole in the sac thus confirming its anomalous connection. A single absorbable 6-0 vicral suture is sufficient to close the small defect in the sac. The skin is closed with the same absorbable suture. Histopathological examination of the vertical sections of the excised tract show transitional epithelium similar to the lacrimal sac. 80% of the cases are lined by stratified squamous epithelium like in a normal common canaliculus. The patient did very well with no visible blemish three months after the surgery. This surgery, if performed with patience and precision, can achieve complete excision of the fistulous tract with good anatomic and functional outcome. I shall be telling this, but not with a sigh. Somewhere, ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I cut the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference.